Hi there, my name is PJ and this is Serial Chillers, where we cover solved and unsolved true crime cases that focus mainly on, well, serial killers, hence the name. In today's case, we're going to cover quite an old case, not as old as Victorian England, so don't get excited, that one is coming. This one has its roots in early 20th century America, so United States, and has become infamous due to two things cannibalism involving children and a harrowing bone chilling letter that was sent to one of the victim's parents. Have you guessed it yet viewers? Sit back, dim the lights and lock the doors. This is the case of the Brooklyn vampire, Albert Fish. Again, like the previous John Bonet Ramsey case, this one is so complex and interesting, I didn't want you to miss too much or for me to miss out anything or for you to have too long a video to have to sit and watch. So I've split it into two parts. Part one, this one, surprisingly, will cover Albert Fish's early life and what led him into his criminal endeavours. Are you ready? Let's go. Hamilton Howard Albert Fish was born on the 19th of May 1870 in Washington DC and from an early age he'd had what could be best described as an interesting hand dealt to him. He was born into a family with deep and at the time severe mental conditions so Fish at an early age had been subjected to what would be you know, considered at the time some pretty strange behaviour. In fact, some of it would be pretty strange behaviour nowadays. But nowadays you take a few pills, talk to a specialist, and it's more normalised, accepted. But back then, you could be thrown into an asylum for a bit of anxiety. Not great. Now Fish was the youngest of four children and his father, when he was born, was <laughs> pushing 75 years old. That's some energy. Now, like most children, Fish experienced bullying at an early age and ended up adopting the name Albert in honour of a dead relative. And from really hating his first name, Hamilton, because the kids at school used to bully him and call him names, including giving him the nickname Ham and Eggs. Now, I'm sure you'll agree nowadays that's pretty shit banter, but back then, it was harsh. Now, as I mentioned earlier, his family had a bit of a history of mental illness, including his uncle, who had mania, one of his brothers was actually confined to a mental state hospital and his sister was diagnosed with a mental affliction, whatever that means. His mother suffered from oral and visual hallucinations, which seems to be inherited, which we'll find out later on in this video. And actually several other family members that he had were diagnosed with mental conditions. So when I said he was dealt an interesting hand, do you get it now? Now things didn't really get much better for Albert um, as when he was only five years old his father died from a heart attack which given the nature of his job it was quite a labour intensive one and remember his age you know the guy was pushing what 80 by then um, it wasn't a shock but still had repercussions on the family. His mother could no longer afford to keep such a young child around the household so he was actually put into St. John's Orphanage in Washington DC. Now this is where Albert's unusual behaviour really did start. He was regularly physically abused, which isn't surprising considering the horror stories that have come out recently about these locations. But the shocking thing is, he was quoted as saying he began to enjoy the pain that it inflicted. Now, fast forward five years later, when Fish was 10, his mother actually managed to successfully secure a, a government job. So it was quite well paid and could afford to look after him. So brought him back into the family home. Now, imagine how sort of messed up Albert Fish would have been after five years of being away from his family at such a young age. You know, these are the embryonic ages. These are the formative years. So that sort of dynamic coming back into that family home must have been odd. If any viewers have had a similar situation where they've, you know, perhaps been orphaned and then gone into foster care or 
I'd love to hear your actual experiences because it'd be interesting. Now, when Fish was 12 years old, he actually started a romantic relationship with a local paper boy. He actually introduced him to some of Fish's weird interests that would stick with him for life, such as urolagnia, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is the drinking of urine, and coprophagia, which is the eating of the other side of your body. What comes out of it? Yeah, shit. Okay, so we'll probably all agree that is a bit disgusting, but for another young boy to introduce him to these things, that's also very concerning. What happened to this other kid for him to know about these sort of acts? Anyway, due to this, Fish then began to frequently visit public baths so he could kind of peep on other young lads getting changed. And a lot of his weekends were spent doing this. Now, this is just a, an introduction to Fish's early life. And I wish that I could say it was just a phase and he progressively got out of it, but sadly not. And this isn't the channel for those sort of stories. If you want feel good, go watch Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. Actually, it's really good. But for Fish, things got progressively worse. Now, it's 1890 and Fish has just turned 20. He moves to the Big Apple, New York, and ends up getting into the world of male prostitution. Now, it was at this age that he started to molest young boys, um, mostly younger than six. Now, this disturbing behaviour carried on for another eight years until Fish's mother decided that he just needed to be with a lovely woman to help curb his desires. So she ultimately arranged um, a marriage for him to a girl nine years his junior in 1898. Now, I'm not usually a fan of arranged marriages for obvious reasons, but this one seemed to do a lot of good as it saved the innocence of many young boys in the New York area during the 1890s. Now, Fish and his new wife actually had six children together and life seemed to normalize for the Fish family. But as with most characters like this, the normalcy didn't last long. And in 1903, Fish was actually arrested for grand larceny, which if you're not aware, is theft of a property up to a certain value. It's quite severe in, in the United States. So Fish was sent to the infamous Sing Sing. Now, after Fish had done his stint at Sing Sing, he was released back into the world and found himself a job in Wilmington, Delaware. It was here that he met and became enamored with a 19-year-old lad called Thomas Kedden. Supposedly, Kedden was intellectually disabled, whatever that means. And it was theorized that Fish coerced and manipulated the 19-year-old to enter into a sadomasochistic relationship. So despite the normalization period where he was married, of course, your underlying urges never go away and they must have bubbled back to the surface during his tenure at Sing Sing. Now the relationship wasn't to last long and after 10 days, Fish brought Kedden to an old farmhouse in the area and tortured him for a period of over two weeks. Now, the 19-year-old was surprisingly still alive after all of this abuse. You know, Jigsaw talks about that, that will to live, excuse the weird voice. Um, and wow, Kedden had buckets of it, unless he enjoyed the sadism. I mean, some people do. Anyway, he definitely would not have enjoyed what Fish did next to him. And again, sort of foreshadows Fish's MO in future crimes that we'll delve into in part two. Fish tied Kedden up and cut off half of his penis. As a man, yeah, that's uh, not great. What's also not great is Fish's commentary at a later date about the whole situation. Now listen to this, and I quote, I shall never forget his scream or the look he gave me. Now, Fish had actually intended to kill Kedden, cut him up, and take him home with him. I'm getting Dharma before Dharma vibes. Instead, he realised this wasn't really practical, so poured peroxide over Kedden's wound, 
wrapped the stump of a penis in a Vaseline handkerchief, and then to add insult to injury, gave the 19 year old a $10 bill for his trouble. I don't really know the conversion to today's rate when you factor in inflation, etc. but it's probably not gonna be more than a few hundred dollars. He then had the cheek to kiss Kedden goodbye before jumping on the next train out of there. Fish was later reported as saying he didn't even know what ever happened to Kedden and he never heard about him again. But now viewers, you and I are really starting to see the real evil that's bubbling underneath the surface of Albert Fish. Now Fisher's wife must have found all of his actions and little secrets a bit sus as she left him in 1917. She didn't just leave him though, she left the kids as well, which, you know, is a bit shitty as a mother, but I don't know the whole situation. Well, not as a mother, excuse that, just as a parent in general, because it works for both sides. Now what added insult to injury to Fish is that she'd actually had an affair with the handyman that oh. the family had put up, who'd been living with them as a boarder for the last few months. Ow! Now, supposedly, she didn't only take what was left of Fisher's pride, but she actually took almost all of the family possessions from the house and left them with nothing, according to Fish, which isn't the most reliable of sources. Now, his mental health, which obviously was fractured at this point, took a bit of a downward spiral even further as he began to suffer auditory hallucinations, as his mother did, if you recall from earlier in the video, which meant that he began doing really strange things, including wrapping himself up in a carpet and saying it was upon orders from John the Apostle. Now his infatuation with masochism took on another level as he began to insert needles into his groin and abdomen area, beat himself with a nail studded paddle. <laughs> I can't believe I'm even saying this and even shoved wool doused with lighter fluid into his asshole and light it. I mean, if you think all of that's bad, you won't like the next bit because, you know, all of that is self-inflicted, but the next bit him involved his children and their friends and asked them to repeatedly beat him with that nail studded paddle. I've just got no words for this circus. Now, I do want to caveat that with, there was no evidence or concern from anyone that he actually abused his children in any way at all, despite the horrors and evil that was to come. Now, following his wife leaving him in 1917, the preceding 11 years really escalated Fisher's cruelty. In 1919, he stabbed a disabled boy in Georgetown, Washington, DC. Now this is the catalyst for him mainly targeting African-American boys who he believed that, you know, just like in the Jeffrey Dahmer case, the authorities wouldn't miss or care about if they did go missing. He also claimed to have paid young boys to procure other children for him, who he tortured, mutilated, and killed with some pretty disturbing tools known only as his implements of hell. Now, whether that was self-titled or somebody else gave them that name, either way, it's disgusting. But they involved a meat cleaver, butcher knife, and a small handsaw. Disgusting. Now, we'll return to Fish's implements of hell in a second, but before I get to that, I need to make you aware of Fish's repeated attempts to kidnap and kill eight-year-old Beatrice Keel, who he found playing on her parents' Staten Island farm. Initially, Fish went up to her and said, you know, would you like some money to help me pick some rhubarb? You know, I'm a friendly guy. Do you wanna, do you wanna come and help me pick some rhubarb? There's some money in it for you. And, you know, the girl was like, an innocent eight-year-old didn't think of any of the dangers, so said yes. And it was fortunate that her mother caught sight of fish in the distance and chased him off the farm. It was like, you know, stay away from my daughter, you creep. But Fish wasn't one to be pushed away easily. And he actually returned to the farm and again tried to get close to Beatrice. But fortunately, again, he was sleeping in one of the old farm houses um, and Beatrice's father found him sleeping there and again, chased him off the farm. 
you know, I wish I could say it was a happy ending. I mean, it was for Beatrice and her family, but sadly, this man, this evil person, person's a bit of a stretch, had these urges to kill. And sadly, he ended up satisfying them. Three days later, Francis MacDonnell, another child on Staten Island, became Fish's victim. Now, according to Fish, and which seems quite a common trait in these psychopaths, blaming somebody else and pushing accountability elsewhere, said that God commanded him to torture and sexually mutilate children. For what reason? I just... I can't even with this monster. So, dear viewers, that ends part one of the awful Albert Fish case. I wish that I could say that we visited most of his darkest crimes, but alas, I would be lying. But please do like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss part two of this macabre and grisly tale. So as usual, viewers, stay safe. Uh -huh.